Uh-oh, it looks like we've piqued your interest in the hideout. First of all, let me tell you what the hideout is not. The hideout is not for hustlers, for grinders, or for people who are looking for a shortcut to what the world calls success. The hideout is about growing as men, creating lifelong friendships, and having the time of our lives. Are you ready to tap in to the endless source that will take you from success to significance? The hideout is two and a half days of hiking, biking, and doing the little things that it takes to create lifelong friendships. I find that joy is nothing more than falling in love with your current circumstances and allowing magic to happen. And that's when we see growth in every area of your life. Have you accomplished your goals professionally and financially and you still thirst for something more? Has success in these areas come at the expense of far more valuable things like your family, your children, and your relationships? Alignment in business strategic partnerships, and joint ventures all come from true relationships. The Hideout is designed to get to know people before you'll ever meet them. This is not your typical mastermind. The Hideout is focused on the one thing that will fuel everything, joy. And when joy is overflowing in your life, you'll find growth in your marriage, your relationships, and oh yeah, your business. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. Every one of you saw the uh, the commercial. You guys have been seeing it and it has been, it's about the hideout and the hideout just happened September 23rd through the 25th, but the winter is coming. We just released the dates, which is February 2nd through the 4th. We only allow 12 guys. If you want to, uh, if you want to, um, to apply, uh, we do an application process because those 12 people, we want to make sure that they're uh, curated at the highest level. And all these guys are, that are coming in, what we found is every single one of them in this last one in September, every single one, 12 out of 12 had a transformation, whether it been personal, <laughs> professional, spiritual, or financial. And we always say that it'll sell out, but we never sell it. And this is the reason why is because every single person that is ready for the hideout, they know. And we don't have to do any convincing. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check out uh, at kellycardenas.com. You can uh, apply there. Uh, like I said, there's 12 spots, and it will sell out and be done by, by Thanksgiving. So if it's something that you're interested in, check it out that way. I'm, I'm very excited for the show today. Uh, we're doing a special Saturday show, and the reason why is because I had to track this woman down. We were back and forth on text. I met her at the Raven Drum. It's right above me right there. Rick Allen and uh, Lauren Monroe have a, uh, a foundation called Raven Drum, and it helps people with PTSD. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Rick Allen is, he's a drummer from Def Leppard, and Lauren Monroe is one of the uh, best musicians that I've ever heard. Uh, but I went to a drum circle, and when I got a chance to go up there, it was some of the greatest drummers in the world, uh, from Godsmack to Lenny Kravitz to Widespread Panic uh, to um, Guns N' Roses, Little Richard, George Harrison, uh, Elton John. All these drummers were there. Paul McCartney's drummer was there. And I got a chance to meet this woman. And when I walked up, uh, as you can see uh, on her face, the, the, the joy, the love, the light, the, uh, the, the light in life was all around her. And so we connected. I told her I was going to force her to be my friend for the rest of her life. And uh, we got a chance to be able to connect. And, and she told me about a, a book that she had written, which was phenomenal. It's called The Joy Plan. And not only is she a best-selling author, but she's an entrepreneur and an accomplished film producer. Um, and we're going to be able to get into that and talk about that. But the biggest thing was is I saw her heart right away. And that's the reason why I wanted to share it with every single one of you. And uh, we're going to go through this journey of joy, uh, which is like the greatest subject, I think, in the entire world and what's missing. Uh, some people, I told a person the other day that if you uh, took a man and you made him vulnerable, uh, you injected joy into him and then dropped his ego poof, you would have a woman. So <laughs> I, just, I, want to welcome, I want to welcome to the show uh, the, the accomplished, the one and only Kaya Roman. Oh, Kelly, can you introduce me every single time I ever do anything? <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> Thank I, you. It is so nice 
nice to be here. Well, it's it's great to have you, and uh, you know, it's a it's a subject that a, a lot of people think is a woo woo kind of thing, but I love it because what you've done and what you've done with your book, with the Joy Plan, you actually broke it down into the actionable steps, and then helped people to understand that it wasn't about the actions, but the intention that you went into mm -hmm. it with. Um, but I think one of the things that stuck out to me, and if you haven't read the Joy, uh, the Joy Plan by Kaya Roman, guys, you're doing yourself a dis, uh, disfavor. Um, if you, even if that's a word, I make up words on this show all the time. Um, <laughs> but you're doing yourself a disservice because this is one of the books that will absolutely capture you within the first two paragraphs of reading it. And what I saw was is the vulnerability. Can we talk about that right off the bat? Because it wasn't like you walked into this book or even that when you speak, it's not like you walk in and say, I'm an authority. You were like, you know what? I, I was kind of broken. I had some, uh, you know, I had three things that uh, came out. Uh, the the first one was bankruptcy. Second one was uh, uh, buyout, and the third one was the. Tell me the third one. The I, I had it. I had it. I mean, depression. <laughs> yes. So we went. We went into those things. So you opened up with vulnerability. What gives you the permission to be vulnerable? Oh, well, you know, um, actually that night that I met you at the Raven Drum um, Drum Circle, Rick and I had this really special moment where we watched the sunset go down. And I don't know if you've ever seen the green flash. It's like a very rare thing that you can see if the conditions are perfect. Kaya, I don't believe in it. <laughs> Everyone's told me about it and they keep telling me to wait. I live by the coast. I've watched it for oh, 29 yeah. years and I don't believe that it happens. I believe it's a theory. We saw it. <laughs> Rick and I saw it and it is real. And in that moment, he was telling me your vulnerability is your greatest strength. And I mean, this is from Rick Allen, like he lost his arm and became one of the greatest drummers of all time. Like talk about vulnerability becoming his strength that he lives into every day. And I just find that, you know, we, we all need to embrace our challenges. It's hard being human and we need to just like, share that and be honest with it. And that's how we learn and that's how we grow. So if anyone could you know, like benefit from my vulnerability and my struggles, then it kind of gives it meaning somehow. Well, I, I think it's incredible because, you know, you were at a point when you when you started in on this journey of joy, you were at a point where it wasn't the wasn't the high point. You had invested you that had invested sure. a ton of money, right? Your husband and you had invested a ton of money, a ton of energy, eighteen hour days, you know, telling your family that, hey, when this thing pops, I'm working hard. When this thing pops, yeah. then everything's gonna be cool. And then it wasn't cool. Can you go into that part? Because I, I, I like literally, it was gripping me as I was reading. Oh. And well, as it an was entrepreneur, like, you can probably relate. <laughs> every day, every day, every yeah. day, every day. So tell us yeah. about tell us about that journey and and what it meant and uh, you know the, some of the lessons that you learned from it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's like, it's like you said, I didn't, I didn't write the joy plan from a place of joy. I wrote the joy plan from a place of desperately seeking joy because I was in an opposite space. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very painful when you work so hard for something, you invest so much of your blood, sweat and tears and money and sacrifice your time with your kids and believe that something is happening and and then it doesn't work out. And, you know, I think many people have experienced that and you, know, you could say, oh, it's just a business. But in my case, it was it was very devastating and it sent me into a spiral of depression and anxiety. And and it's it's all kind of ironic because really we, I was just ahead of my time. It was an epigenetic software company that would like take your biomarkers and tell you what the ideal food and exercise program is for you. And now those are like all over the place, right? But this was in 2014 and people weren't ready for it. And um, I, I just had thought, this is it. Like I'm finally going to make my impact and make my income that like I know I can do. And, and then to have it all kind of fall apart. Um, it was definitely devastating. And, and I think the, the most devastating part was just how I struggled to even get out of bed afterwards. And like, you know, the depression would 
pull me down, but then the anxiety was like jacking me up. So I, I couldn't sleep. I like couldn't eat. I just, I felt terrible in my body. I couldn't be present with my kids. Uh, it was not a great time. <laughs> Definitely not my best moment. So I, I did uh, figure out what the other uh, one was. It was shut down the company, buy out and bankrupt. Uh, those are yeah. three things that, yeah. you know, those are three things that an entrepreneur generally, generally, I mean, the buyout part, if you're going to go for a multiple and, uh, you know, your enterprise right. or your business, it can be exciting. Yeah, but, I, yeah, I wanna, but buyout at a loss is not so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, I want to go, go to this place because, um, Kaya, most of the time people who are seeking out a certain thing generally lacked that thing growing up and that therefore they're trying to help other people to be able to experience it. Right. Yeah. When I say this a lot of times, like when you see a a therapist and a lot of people on the show, like you say you see a therapist that is helping kids. Most of the time they had abuse in their childhood and they didn't want that to happen to other kids. You see someone helping people with alcohol. They struggled with alcohol. So you're a person and an authority throughout the world on joy. Um, can you talk to, uh, about young Kaya, because most of the time what you, and we'll get into this here in a bit, but what mm. I, what I kept reading in your book was that joy had nothing to do with accomplishments. So as a kid, did you feel the pressure of having to accomplish so things would be okay? <laughs> Are you my therapist? <laughs> yes. Uh, you nailed me. Um, you know, my, my parents, didn't mean to get pregnant. They got pregnant super young. Um, so I kind of say like I, my parents and I grew up together and I was often the caretaker in the relationship and things were not always together, you know, when I was growing up and, um, like many people, I experienced some, some traumas in my childhood. And I think I always felt like I gotta, I gotta keep it together. I have to keep accomplishing to feel safe. And I just, I adopted this entrepreneurial spirit at a really young age. I started my first business when I was 10 years old and hadn't stopped since. Um, so yeah, I think, I think you're really right. And like, I have always had this kind of overactive voice in my head um that doesn't shut up and it's not you know generally i mean i'm you know through the joy plan and the practices that i use now i've been able to retrain it but it wasn't generally a very happy voice it was like oh my god oh my god am i going to be okay what do i do what do i do you know anxiety 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 fear 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 I think a lot of people live with this and we just don't talk about it. And actually it's, you know, I can tell you scientifically what it is in the default mode network. Um, but yeah, this has been going on for me for a super long time since my childhood. Well, let's go back to the childhood. You, 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 you yada yada me there for a second to Elaine from Seinfeld. Um, because <laughs> when you were going through it, you said, I, you know, I went through some stuff. I had to do this. I had some traumas, yada, yada, yada. Let's go to the traumas. Because the traumas are generally just go I, right there. Well, I want to go. I want to go to that place because I think that okay. the the traumas are what create that what you call the bitch inside your head, right? And that's what yeah. that's the, what you named her. And yeah. you know that voice that a lot of us have. We think a lot of people, and what I find is when I sit down and talk with people, almost every single one of them is like, "This is how I was built. This is who I am." And I'm like. And then we get into the conversation and it's like, yeah. no, it's not who you are. It's what happened to you and what you didn't deal with and what, did, yeah. you know, some of those traumas. So let's talk about some of those traumas because there's so many people out there with the traumas that feel alone. So what, let's, yeah. let's, let's go into the first trauma. What was the first thing that you, that you experienced? <sighs> okay. Well, I didn't expect to talk about this today, but in the spirit of helping others. Okay, you Kaya, know, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Kaya, hold on. We, I asked you two questions before we started. I, number one, did. do you have a time constraint? And number two, is yes. there anything is off anything limits? anything off limits? Exactly. No, and I, what you said, what you said was, no, there's nothing off limits. So yeah. what, what, what we want to do is, is, okay, I, I'm going to get this out of the way. Number one, super crazy, uh, um, uh, accomplished film producer produced a, a film with Lamar Odom has a, 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 a film that's coming out with Dr. Joe Dispenza, which is called frequency, the future of all things. Um, you know, accomplished best-selling author, entrepreneur, one of the best speakers in the world. Guys, you all know this, you all know this about Kaya. We want to know Kaya. 
we want to know who Kaya is. Let's go to that first trauma, uh, Kaya, that one that made you feel a little uncomfortable. Let's go. All right, Kelly. Well, I appreciate it. Look, I don't I don't like to have fake conversations either. And like I said, I believe that your vulnerability is your greatest strength. So, um, yeah, I, I had some sexual trauma at a young age. I think, unfortunately, this is the story that so many people have that they don't want to share. Um, it was an older boy, uh, son of a friend of my mom's. Um, I didn't really speak up about it. I didn't know how to deal with it. I was only four years old. Um, it affected me, you know, that kind of stuff goes into your, into your DNA and, and left me feeling not safe. And I think for so many people that bitch in your head, it's, it's just the mechanism that we all have that's trying to keep us safe. It's scanning for danger. And so when you have a trauma like that at a young age, of course you have proof that there's actual danger in your environment. And I think it, you know, it, it put me on high alert, um, scanning for that type of danger. And then like, just, I had some crazy stuff happen when I was a child. I, I had three attempted kidnappings. <laughs> I mean, who has that <laughs> um, between the age of uh, five and 12? You know, thankfully they, they were none of them successful, but um, I kind of lived in this state of like, just, yeah, not feeling safe. And it, yeah, it affected me. How could it not? Kaya, talk to us about the, the first time when there was a kid. I mean, cause this is probably one of the, we're, we're going to go, we're going to go into the, the, the four year old part of it too here in a second, but it's, it's really piqued the interest when you say about the kidnappings, because this is probably as a young kid, every single kid is probably one of the, one of the largest fears that we don't talk about because our parents will say, you got to be watch out for stranger, stranger, danger, all the stuff. And then we're like, yeah, yeah, whatever, mom, dad. Take us through that first one, the attempted kidnapping. Take us through that, what you were feeling, and 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 paint the picture for us as if you as if we were as if we were watching the movie. This is so crazy, Kelly. I have like never spoken publicly about any of these things, but I appreciate you taking me there because if if this can possibly help anyone out there who has had some kind of similar trauma in your childhood, then, you know, I'm, I'm willing to share <laughs> for the hope of helping others. Um, so the first time, um, whew, my, like I said, my parents were really young when they had me, they didn't have their stuff together to make enough money to support themselves, let alone a kid. So my mom, we were living in uh, downtown Atlanta and my mom had this little shop in Little Five Points um, that she started with a partner. And I think they were like constantly getting robbed and there were all these financial troubles and she owed the lady money and her boy, my, the partner's boyfriend was in jail. And so the, this business partner of my mom, who by the way, it was her son who uh, molested me, um, said when my, when my boyfriend gets out of jail, watch out because my mom owed her money. So what happened was, uh, when the boyfriend got out of jail, they showed up at my school. Um, I normally would, I was in first grade. I would, uh, like walk out of the school and wait on the street for my mom to pull up and, and pick me up. But they pulled up and they said, Hey, your mom sent us to pick you up. And I was like, oh, I, I don't think so. She didn't tell me that. And then they grabbed me and tried to pull me into the car. And thankfully, somehow, by the grace of God, I, I wriggled away and I and my mom then um, pulled up and I just ran to her. And, uh, and we actually kind of like dodged out of town after that. <laughs> how, how, old are you, how, uh, Kaya, uh, how old are you at this time? I was six. Okay. So at four, had you, had you talked about the, the, uh, you know, the sexual assault? Did you talk with your mom about it? Did you let someone know? Because so many kids don't because they think yeah. that something was wrong with them or, you know, someone's going to get in trouble or they're going to get in trouble or whatever it was. Can you take us into the mind and the psyche of a four-year-old that this happens to? And, and it happens all too often. It happened to my family also. And, um, you know, it happened in, in friends of ours family and, and, 
it, it's crazy because from a theory standpoint, this is where the theory is, Kaya, is if that happened to my kid, I would kill somebody. That's what I think. <laughs> But then yeah. it happens to you and you freeze because everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? And so take us through that, like at, at four years old, take us to little four-year-old Kaya. Like, what are you, what are you thinking? How are you, I mean, do, are you able to, do you have anyone to talk to? I think I, I tried to tell my mom like best I could, you know, with the ability that I had to communicate at that time. I don't think she really understood the impact and actually, um, I don't want to make my mom feel bad, but I mean, she said something along the lines of, uh, you know, guys are always going to be jerks. If you're like a pretty girl, boys are just always going to be like that. And I didn't feel like she stood up for me. And I still had to be around this boy and he would still always grab me and try and push me up against walls and kiss me and just be super gross. And yeah, I just didn't really feel like she was doing anything about it. So it didn't feel like I had someone else I could talk to. My dad wasn't really around at that time. And yeah, I just didn't really feel, I think that's when I went into the mindset of, I'm on my own. I got to take care of myself. I have to be tough. I have to, um, no one else is going to be looking out, out for me in this world. So how does this impact future relationships with boys? Um, uh, because I mean, did you, did you end up uh, choosing some bad ones in high school and junior high? And God. yes, I've still chosen bad ones as an adult too. Um, yeah, you really should be my therapist. Um, <laughs> well, the reason why I say the reason why I say this stuff too, Kai, and the reason why I ask the questions is because it's what our whole platform is about, and what this podcast is about. It's not uh, like I, I can not to say that I'm not a respecter of what people do. Like when I had when we had Rick Allen, who's the greatest drummer in the world from Death Leopard on the show, or the general manager of the Tennessee Titans, or Stephen Covey for that matter. I, I know mm. that the world knows about his books. I know the world knows about right. like, uh, what uh, John Robinson has done with the Titans, which is the greatest organization of all time. And you know what uh, uh, Rick has done. But a lot of times we don't know who the person is. And I want to yeah. make sure that, that we have real, real conversations because what I want to know from this point too is, okay, we're going to go, you're not off the hook with the boys because we're going back to the boys. But I, I want you to talk to, talk, do me a favor right now, is I'd like you to look into the camera and I want you to talk to two people. Number one, I want you to talk to the parents of someone who possibly was abused. And number two, I want you to talk to the kid who was abused. Well, first of all, if you're the kid who was abused, it is not your fault. And you did not deserve that. And you are beautiful and perfect and you are not broken. And it's okay to hurt and it's okay to be angry. And this does not need to ruin your life, but you might need help because trauma is stored in our body. And you might need help to release that trauma. So please get that help. And if you are the parents of a kid who you suspect might have experienced some kind of abuse, I encourage you to find a way to get your kid to feel safe enough to tell you about it. And your job is to listen and to hold them and to help them feel safe and not make it about you and being angry or whatever your opinions are, but just be there for, for your kid. They really need to feel like you've got them. You're holding them and keeping them safe right now. Now let's go to the, to the, uh, well, I'm going to say the fun part, but it's not going to be so fun, but let's go to the part about the boys because I watched this and this made me so angry as a kid growing up. Cause I would see a woman like you, very beautiful woman. I would see a woman like you and then they would be with a bonehead and they would be with a bonehead and the boy wouldn't be opening their door. Like my mom told me every single day of my life, she would stand in front of a door and she would say, if you, if you do not open that door to our three boys growing up, she said, I will not walk in the door. I will not go in the store. She would be standing out on the sidewalk and be like, 
Now, I'm not saying that we turn out to be great, boy, like perfect boys. Nobody's perfect. But I was so angry. I would look at these beautiful women, had so much going for them, all this stuff. And then they would be with a bonehead who didn't treat them well. But take us into that psyche because what I've realized over time is most of the time the woman is choosing, a lot of times they're choosing their abuser to be with them. Can you talk to it? Can you help me with this? Because I've got a daughter who's 13 and I need some help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, and I have two teenage daughters as well. And so I think that I, I hope they will learn <laughs> from my mistakes. And like you said, I think you're, you're just really accurate that um, when you have an experience like I had at a young age, um, you, it can be easy as a girl or a young woman to think that's what you deserve or somehow you're locked into uh, that biological chemical experience in your body and somehow trying to recreate it, maybe to integrate it or who knows, I could, I could psychobabble it, but, uh, like, yeah, in my experience, it seems like, uh, the only boys I was attracted to were jerks that didn't treat me that well. Um, I recently like learned, actually learned what a narcissist is and how there's this whole, like, um, typical relationship between an empath and a narcissist. And I mean, I'm definitely an empath and uh, I think I've had three, my, you know, really just three relationships in my life and they've all been with narcissists. Um, unfortunately, you know, I've, I finally got I my, I do write about my marriage in my book, but, uh, kind of only the good parts of the marriage. There were, there were definitely parts of that marriage that were not good. So I, I finally got out of that marriage a few years ago. Um, so I have not chosen great relationships, unfortunately. Um, I don't think I yet even know what that feels like to really be with someone who shows up for me and matches me on the level of connection and commitment that I really want, you know, a partner to experience joy and love and abundance and magic with. Uh, and I, I'm sure the trauma plays a role in that. So it's something I'm still healing. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't uh, claim to be a world expert in joy because I experience joy and my life is perfect every single day. I am for sure a work in progress. Well, I think that's why you're an authority on joy is because you're not standing on the hill telling everyone you need to get to where I am. You're down, <laughs> you're down in with everyone else. And that's the reason why you're so relatable, Kaya. That's, I mean, for me, reading, uh, reading your book and experiencing you for the short amount of time, I could tell the fact that it wasn't that you were coming at and preaching at it. It was like, no, I'm going through this stuff. And if I can go through this stuff, you can too. Talk to the young ladies out there that are making boneheaded choices, right? But they don't see it. Can you tell us about some of the early signs that now you see so clearly in a relationship that you didn't see when you were, you know, young Kaya just kind of picking out whoever? Yeah. Well, hmm. if you are attracted to someone who talks more about himself than he asks about you, takes more than he gives, uh, doesn't follow through on the things he says he will, doesn't show up for you, doesn't support you, doesn't take great care of you, doesn't treat you well, then I think you should look at why that is. Because girl, you deserve better. <laughs> and maybe you don't realize what you deserve. And, you know, ultimately the most important relationship that any of us can ever have is our relationship with ourself, our relationship with ourself and our relationship with spirit or God, or, you know, whatever you experience as kind of that magical field of energy that we're all connected to. Um, but most of all, you know, that's you, God is in you, spirit is in you. And so I think really attracting the right relationship starts with having the right relationship with yourself and respecting yourself. And people have told me this and I know, you know, you can hear the words and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But really embodying it is something different. And I think that's, that's a journey that if you're not there, if you're struggling with being in a relationship with someone who isn't treating you well, then it is worth 
investing the time and the resources and and the help to you know go to something like the hideout and 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 find other women and support and do things to lift yourself up read the joy plan do the practices in the joy plan but you know really love you first and then you can be a vibrational match for someone who can really show up for you can you talk to us too because you just said something about treating you good can you define a man treating a woman well or good in your eyes <sighs> well you know men and women and I, I mean i speak in generalities of course there's a whole spectrum but in generalities <laughs> men and women are like we're biologically different you know women are gonna have like you know you're welcome human race that women birth <laughs> our progeny and so because of that we have hormonal fluctuations you and do? because Hold of on. you do you guys <laughs> fluctuate you guys have fluctu you guys have highs and lows we do and you know what you should be down on your knees thanking us for that because we put our bodies through so much to birth our species so first of all just like to be a good man to a woman you gotta just have mad respect for like what we go through on a monthly basis that our hormones are always changing that we that we carry babies in our bodies and we breastfeed them and we have this like even if, you know, women who aren't mothers, but just our empathic nature, the way that we're biologically built to care for the community, to scan for danger, to care for the family, we are bi biologically wired that way. And so to really show up and treat a woman well, um, be sensitive to like her needs and her emotions, don't minimize them ask you don't have to have all the answers maybe you know a lot of times a woman will go into some explanation or thing and it's like a lot and and the guy could maybe be overwhelmed by how to even respond but just a few responses like how can i support you right now or um what would feel good to you right now or like, you know, I think it's really important to understand love languages as well. Like that um, book, The Five Love Languages is, I just think required reading for anyone who has any interest in being in a relationship. And so like, if your woman's love language is touch, like hold her, you know? If her, if her love language is words, give her some nice words. And, and these are habits, like, you know, you have to, it might not come naturally to you to do these things, but if you care about really showing up for someone, then train yourself, form some new habits. So let's, let's take it, uh, take it here because, you know, you said the, oh, you, well, you wrote it in your book. I was repeating it, which was the, the B inside, right? The, the head, the inside your head, mm, the, the talking, yeah. right? I, I still want to stay in the construction of that. So we had the, the trauma at four years old. We had the yeah. attempted kidnap at six. When was the next one? Um, I believe I was 10 or 11. This was so crazy. Let's go. <sighs> I can't even believe some of the things that have happened to me <laughs> in my life. Um, so I was living in this small town in uh, New Mexico and there was a jail up on the hill. And every morning I walked kind of far uh, to the bus stop to get to school. And I guess uh, that morning they released a criminal from jail and he walked out of the jail, walked down the hill and the first human that he saw was little, I don't know, 10 or 11 year old me walking to the bus stop. And so he just went for me. Uh, he started chasing me. And um, again, thankfully, I have some incredible um, angels watching over me. I was able to outrun him. And um, and uh, knocked, knocked on the door of a house and, and they let me in and it was, it was weird because I told the people, Hey, somebody's chasing me. And then we looked out and he had like, once I went in the house, he'd run the other way. And so 
they didn't see him and they kind of didn't, again, like didn't really believe me. And so I just like got on the bus and I went to school. And then when I came home from school at the end of the day, I told my mom and, and my stepdad, she was married at the, by that time. And then he called the police and then I, I was able to describe the guy and they were able to say, oh yeah, we know who that was. We let him out of jail this morning. Um, so that was crazy experience number two, whatever. That was number, <laughs> number two. two. What's number three? When was number three? And then the, the next one happened, um, I think I was 12. Um, I was getting dressed, um, in my room. Um, maybe my curtains were a little bit see-through. I don't know. And someone from outside on the street, um, I had a, I had a door to my bedroom. It, it was locked, but it was a door that could, could access directly into my bedroom from the outside of the house. And someone from the street came in and started like trying to uh, break down the door and get in. And um, thankfully, again, my, my stepdad was in the house and I, I told him, Hey, someone's like trying to break in. And it was, it was some man. And, um, and my stepdad ended up <laughs> grabbing a gun and um, chasing him down the street. And he, he got away and my stepdad didn't shoot him, but Whew, that he should have. He, he should have. He should have shot him and should have been okay with it. That's a, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so let me let me ask you this too. Does that? How does this affect a, a woman's self image too? Because like I've seen it go both ways, where there'll be the woman who maybe you know experiences sexual abuse early on and then um, overeats to make sure that she isn't attractive, so no one comes at her again. These things happen. Yeah. Then there's the other side that you know. Um, maybe needing to feel a certain way or m- wanting to make sure that, that, you know, you're, you're performing at this level. A lot of times eating disorders on the other side come in. Were any mm-hmm. of these, were any of these body, like image challenges, were any of those present with you as you were growing up? Um, the eating thing I never had, but, um, it was really interesting after the experience that I had at four years old, I developed psoriasis, which is a, uh, it's an autoimmune disease, but it's, it's a skin condition. And, um, at some point maybe we'll talk about, you know, a big part of my healing has been working with psychedelic medicine. Uh, but in, um, a, a psychedelic journey that I had with a very powerful plant medicine called Iboga, um, it took me back to that memory when I was four years old and kind of like my brain saying, I am going to make myself not attractive. So nobody ever wants to touch me in that way again. And right after that, I developed this, like, um, you know, the skin condition all over my body. Um, I'm healed from it now, but that was my life for many years. And so I kept myself covered and I kept myself, I, I tried to kind of, um, not stand out. So let's go, let's go to the, the persona part. It's Dr. Garoli's, right? So yes. Dr. Garoli, uh, it's, it's six different types. It was a six. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it was six different types. They called it the persona. Um, you know, it was a Carl Jung, uh, you, you refer to in your book that, uh, that talked about the masks that we wear. Mm-hmm. And yes. I think this was so important because I mean, <laughs> it, it, let's just call it for what it is. Social media is a mask, right? And in of most course. cases, it's a mess. They, you don't have people a lot of times talk about things that are going wrong or the thing, you know, the, the, hum, you know, the yeah. humanity <laughs> that they, that they have. But we just, we, it was great because for, for us here, it's, we understand where your persona was built, right? So this girl mm-hmm. at four years old, four years old gets sexually abused, um, doesn't really get validated in it. And, you know, and then the, the kidnappings happen, but the kidnapping, the first kidnapping happens by a person that is connected with your family. So there can be not, I'm not saying that you resent, but there can be some, wow. I mean, is this like, it, it's, it's close to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like, I'm not safe even in situations where I should be. And so you built, you built up this persona. You called her the bee in your head. 
Um, right. Can you talk to people about the construction of these? Because this was mind blowing to read about this when you were talking about it because you went in and I loved it because you were like, I like to geek out on the scientific part. I love to also. I just Yay. think it's so cool. So let's go into the yeah. persona. Can you break that down for them and then go into your persona? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So this amazing doctor, Dr. Alberto Garoli, he's based in Italy and he has actually measured the brains of over 2000 people with EEG uh, with this theory that our early childhood traumas actually create a certain pattern of scarring in the brain six unique types of scarring he's discovered uh, through his research that, you know, there are actually more than six types um, that will become your coping mechanism for how you try to keep yourself safe. And, you know, I mean, we're animals. All animals are wired to, to survive and to keep ourselves safe. And with humans, we develop this coping mechanism called a persona. And the persona is the mask that you wear. It becomes active when you feel like you might not be safe. And it's this image that you project to the world that at some point you picked uh, which one is going to be most successful for you in childhood um, that will help keep you safe. And so um, in my case, what he has the the names of them um in my case the name of the persona is the nervous persona and the nervous persona is the one that determines if i can keep everything under control then i will be safe so these become like super high achievers um they they will um be the ones that will yeah just like i'm gonna do it i got this i i am gonna take care of everything and then i will know that i am safe then there's there's people that um you know maybe have a sanguine persona and their coping mechanism is i'm gonna gather as many friends around me as possible um and then i'll be safe because as the more people that like me um the, you know then the better off i'll be um, there's the melancholic persona, which is if I'm like kind of sick and weak, then other people will take care of me. So I'm going to be sort of, you know, melancholy and, and like, I'm going to need others to take care of me. And then, and then that will keep me safe. Um, there's the phlegmatic persona, which is I am going to, uh, preserve and save all of my resources and ha just like, uh, use as little as possible and save up all the things that I need to be around me and just focus on like my basic essentials and not feel too much, just like have the basic essentials that I need and then I'll be safe. Um, let's see, that's what's left. <laughs> um, there's the lymphatic persona, which will put off making any decisions if I procrastinate, if I delay, if I don't upset anyone over here or anyone over there, then I'll be safe. Um, that's the lymphatic. Uh, I think would, I got would all we of be, them. In. Kaya, would we be correct in saying that every one of these is built and constructed? I mean, if you look at yours and yours was called the which one was it called? The nervous. The nervous. Okay. So if we look at, and we look at young Kaya growing up in a situation with a single mom, uh, going through the things that you were going through in uh, little in Atlanta with little five points, all the stuff, I mean, this would construct and it would be like a textbook nervous yeah. persona that comes through. Yes. Would we be, would we be correct in saying that every one of those, cause a lot of people, they'll say like, I took a multiple intelligences test and I am this type of person. Therefore I only listen like this or learn like this. And what I've right. argued, with, what I've argued with these people is no, that's what was constructed by a lot of things that have happened in your life. You were built perfect, but there was things that happened. And when we don't deal with those things and we don't connect with those things, then we start to almost be a self-fulfilling prophecy. I, oh, I'm just a nervous person. I hear this all the time. I'm just a nervous person. Right. Oh, I'm just a melancholy person. No, no, no. There's a reason why you were. There's a yeah. reason for that. And, you know, I, I, I've never met a person that was born shy. Never. There's never been yeah. a baby. There's never been you a baby. A shy baby. <laughs> There's never been a baby that came out the womb and the doctor was like, we got a shy one here. That doesn't happen. 
right? And so would we be correct in, in, in saying that? Yes. Well, you know, what Dr. Garoli found is that um, it's a it's a particular type of scarring in the brain that you can measure and specific types of childhood experiences tend to create the specific type of persona that people develop in their in their brain. And I think you would be very correct in saying that's the same thing with the various personality tests that you take. And I mean, yeah, you you can absolutely 100% identify with those traits, but there's a reason that we have those traits. We are biological beings. So our, our, our body shape, the shape of our bones, the way our glands work, you know, those will affect hormones and metabolism and certain things that are, that are biological. But then there's the whole psychological aspect as well, which becomes biological because it changes the shape of our brain. And then it changes how we cope with and how we experience in the world and, and, and who we project that we are in the world. Uh, the amazing thing is, though, that, you know, our brains have this incredible neuroplasticity, which means that uh, they can change. So, you know, that's that's the part that gets me really excited. Well, I think that the neuroplasticity is is the superpower and it is yeah. the, like it's the part. And for those of you out there who haven't uh, haven't read Sanjay Gupta's book, you need to read his book, um, Keeping Sharp. And he talked about mm. this. He talked about this and you hear it all the time. And it's it's amazing because you hear thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become a, a part of who you are. Right. Yeah. And, but they don't, most people don't talk about the fact that that's backed by science and there's actual grooves that go into your brain, like what you're yes. talking about, like grooves yeah. in a record. But the cool thing is, is that that can change. How can, can change. that change? How Thank can it goodness. change? Kaya? How can it change? <laughs> Well, I love to talk my one of my favorite things that I like to geek out on is uh, the concept of neural pathways. So um, let me just grab a piece of paper here. So if you take a piece of paper and you carefully fold it in half, then you know you have to like the first time you do it, you have to really carefully line up the corners and press the fold in and then you're gonna, fold it again and you, you know you have to like really make some effort to get that fold in there but then the second time if you open it up again and you want to fold it a second time it'll just go right back because the grooves the folds are already in the piece of paper so this is like a neural pathway in your brain so the first time you're thinking thoughts you're saying words you're taking actions i mean this is how we learn this is how we learn as humans this is how babies learn how to walk it's how you learn how to ride a bike how you learn how to play the piano or you know speak a language you're forming those grooves in your brain or neural pathways which are literally just neurons that clump together and then the more frequently you say those words or visit those same thoughts or do those same actions more neurons clump together and form these you know stronger and stronger and stronger neural pathways, but they are changeable. And so, you know, personally, over the past five years, I've been experimenting with psychedelic medicines, which actually create extra burst of neurons in the brain. So you can have a more, I guess, an easier time of harnessing neuroplasticity to form new neural pathways. But you can also just do it with a lot of intention of daily practices of very intentionally using your thoughts and your words and your actions to form the types of neural pathways that you want, because it's, it's really just biology of what's like going on in your brain. And these, uh, Kaya, these are, these are called synapses or synapse, right? Uh, like when you're, when you're creating them. Synapses. The yeah. Synapses, the yes. synapses are the, uh, so the neurons connect mm -hmm. and then the synapses are at the end of the neurons. The neurons are the baby brain cells. And then the synapses are on the end of the neurons and they communicate with each other. They send signals back and forth to each other. And actually, you know, an interesting thing about those synapses is, um, in trauma, those synapses, the communication gets disorganized and um, damaged. So, uh, I mean, who these days on earth has not experienced some kind of trauma? Like we've all been through this pandemic. Um, like you said, even the kinds of traumas that I've experienced, unfortunately, are very common. 
So there's sort of like big T traumas and little T traumas, but we all have collectively as a human race at this point, almost all of us have experienced some kind of trauma. So we all have these like synapses in our brain that aren't quite firing right. Um, so, you know, geeking out on the science part, I'm always interested in, well, what can repair that damage? What, what can repair the trauma and the PTSD that we're all carrying around in our brain, which then activates that persona that is going to try to keep you safe or the amygdala, which is another thing I love to geek out about and talk about, um, which is this little mechanism. It's actually, if you, if you take your hands, you put your thumbs inside and uh, your palms and make two fists. This is roughly the size of your brain. And there's an amygdala inside each hemisphere. It's right in the center of your brain. It's a little clump of cells. And the amygdala acts like an alarm clock, letting you know when there's danger. And in most of us, that alarm clock is set to go off when there isn't actually danger. Like it's telling you you're being chased by a tiger when I don't know, you're stuck in traffic or you, you have a deadline. And so we, we become wired for like being in a trauma response inappropriately. So yeah, my, one of the missions of my life, I guess, sort of being on the mission of finding and experiencing and spreading joy is trying to figure out how do we repair those synapses and how do we repair trauma in our brains so that, you know, collectively, as a species, we can we can get ourselves out of that state and get ourselves more into a state of joy because, I mean, also joy is contagious, like through mirror neurons, you know, mirror neurons are another type of neuron in the brain that uh, we use for imitating one another. So when you interact with another person, they're actually downloading how you feel whether they want to or not through their mirror neurons. And so the more people that experience joy, like literally the more joy there will be in the world. So it's a, it's a big mission. <laughs> it is. It is a big mission. I think that, uh, can you, can you help us to understand the difference between joy and happiness? Because I think people get confused on this and what we're told and, and, and this is the world, right? So the, what the world tells us is if you go out and if you go out and you accomplish all these things, your pursuit of happiness, you're going to be happy. And yes. what, we, what we've learned through our conversation today is most of the time when you're going after something and your value is based in accomplishment, it's because there was trauma inside that happened that caused you to have to accomplish to get out of that trauma, which will never happen anyway. And I've never mm -hmm. met a person in my life ever, Kaya, that is a goal setter that ever got to a goal and then they were like, I'm good. Never. It just creates another goal. So the difference between having a goal and having a vision is so huge. But I think it, it, the foundation of it is to understand the difference between joy and happiness. And we have the world's authority on joy here with us. So can you help us to understand the difference between the two? Yes. Well, thank you, Kelly. I really like your explanation of the difference between happiness and joy um, as well. But I have like a sciencey brain explanation, um, which I, I think is really cool, um, which is, you know, yes, people go after goals because it's the pursuit of happiness. And that's very accurate because happiness is something we experience in our prefrontal cortex. This is right behind your forehead. This is the front part of the brain where we kind of do our cognitive thought. It's a very surface level experience and it's very transitory. So happiness is stimulated by things that come and go and happiness comes and goes really easily. Happiness is experienced more like a thought than an emotion. Whereas joy is experienced in the limbic system. So the limbic system is the deep mid part of the brain. And yes, <laughs> and, the, and joy is an emotion. And it is a, more of an emotional state that your brain can be in that is less um, modified by your circumstances. If you can train your limbic system to be in a state of joy, you can actually maintain that regardless of the circumstances that are going on in your life because it is a state of being rather than a state of mind. 
So you're saying that you could be uh, sexually abused, almost kidnapped three times, have boneheaded boys in your life and continue to have them, but still be joyful in your life. Autoimmune disease and I have a disabled child. So yes, and you can still have joy. So (laughs) yes. And, and, but, but, and help us, let's go into the happiness part because, again, this is sold to us all the time. The pursuit mm-hmm. of happiness, or the pursuit of this, you just have to be happy. Do what makes you happy. And what I find right. is, is when you just broke it down scientifically, that's why I love it, is because you broke it down scientifically where a lot of people think it's, oh, it's a woo-woo. Oh, you're talking about joy, and it must be woo-woo. No, 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 we ain't talking about woo-woo here. We're talking about the fact that Happiness, if you say chase after happiness, that's like hit, taking a hit of crack cocaine. You're going to go it high it's and then you're going to go low. Yeah. And when you experience joy, you're going to say, I lost my job. Yay, maybe I'm going to get another <laughs> one. I got divorced. Yay, that wasn't the guy for me. I, yeah. had, I had this kind of trauma in my life. Yay, I get to be a, a champion for that type of person. Right. right? Yeah. So let's yes. talk about. So let's talk- part of it is the uh, the nervous system. Which nervous system is activated? And part of it is, I think what you know what I learn and absorb whenever I'm around you or li- even watch your videos is is training yourself to be an optimist and focus on <laughs> gratitude. So I want to talk about both of those things. But first of all, um, I think it's really important to understand the distinction between the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So we have both. But um, happiness actually activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is the one that excites you. Um, Whenever I taught uh, mindfulness in elementary school, I would say um, sympathetic nervous system starts with S. S is for stress. So the sympathetic nervous system actually stresses your body. It increases your heart rate. It makes you sweat. It um, can, you know, make you uh, breathe more uh, quickly, it's that like butterflies in your stomach feeling. It's it's a stress response. And actually, that's what happiness triggers. And joy activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And so what I told my elementary school st- students is parasympathetic starts with P. P is for peace. And the parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and relax mechanism in the body. When you feel safe to digest, you feel safe to rest, your blood pressure and your heart rate slow, and you need to like activate your parasympathetic nervous system to be able to sleep. Um, it is it is what helps you feel calm and, and soothed. So they actually are experienced very differently in the body, joy and happiness. So, Kaya, you you had uh, alluded to uh, something uh, just a second ago. You said, and I want to go right back to it, is, uh, you know, I was listing off a lot of things and traumas that had happened, and you had said that also you had a, um, you know, you, you had a daughter with special needs. Um, because there's a lot of women out there with, uh, with children with special needs, and a lot of them are carrying the fact that... Um, you know, that they had something, they had, they, am I correct on this? I've, I've Friends that I've had that have had children with special needs, a lot of times they think it's an inadequacy in themselves or they're blaming themselves or they go through this. Is this correct or am I way off the reservation in this situation? Well, I, I think every mom, probably every parent, if there's ever anything wrong with their kid, the natural tendency would be to question what could I have done differently? Yeah. Is this my fault? How, how could I have done things differently? Um, I mean, in my case, my daughter was born with a genetic condition. So the only thing that I could have done differently maybe is not have children. (laughs) Um, because I know my mom has this genetic condition as well. Um, you know, it's inherited. Um, but then she, she had, um, an accident, a physical trauma, and it's sort of like the combination of the two. You know, she lives in chronic pain. She's she's practically bedridden at the moment. It's a very, it's really difficult. How, how old is uh, she? How old is she? And what four, is she? What's she dealing she's with? She's fourteen. Um, so, anyone out there who's ever heard of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? It's a connective tissue disorder. It's t- connective tissue makes up thirty percent of the body, and in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, it's like having low thread count sheets. 
Usually your connective tissue is strong. It supports your muscles. It supports your digestive system. It supports your brain, your eyeballs, everything so that your body holds together. And when you have weak connective tissue, it's like nothing holds together very well. And you can have a lot of different symptoms. And um, unfortunately, one of them is a lot of chronic pain, a lot of joints dislocating, a lot of joint pain, a lot of headaches. Um, It's kind of like a smorgasbord of symptoms every day. Um, And then she had a um, huge metal swing bracket thing fall on her head when she was 10 years old. Um, and cause a lot of damage in her spine, nerve damage and, and vertebrates going out of place, uh, which you know maybe wouldn't have been so extreme in someone whose connective tissue can hold things together properly. Um, so that's caused a whole other cascade of problems. So, you know, yeah, Nava, my sweet um, 14 year old, she's got a lot of challenges and it's, um, I think a a beautiful practice in our house to to uh, keep a really good sense of humor around it, because it's kind of like in situations like this, you could either laugh or cry. We do plenty of crying as well. But um, yeah, Nava is a really special being and she really inspires me every day, because even with all of the challenges that she has, she maintains a great sense of humor and still finds things to feel excited about. So let's let's talk about the the changing of the guard. I, I call it that because you know you were in the Silicon Valley like area for you know twenty years. You're going after this thing. Uh, you're you're creating this tech business. Uh, you hear the um, what is it? The bankruptcy, the buyout, and the uh, the shutting down, shutting down, shutting mm-hmm. down of the business. You hear this part, and then you go into this. This area, which most people don't understand, right? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after joy. And some people are like, "Come on!" I mean, you know, because you go from this, this part where you measure everything, and every company in the tech business is built for one reason, and that's to sell mm-hmm. and sell for a multiple, yeah. and sell for a high multiple, and gain venture capital, and bring this in. And it's, it's, you know, there's these metrics all the way through. Well, enjoy. Um, there is metrics, but it, as you found when you were making the plan of joy, that it wasn't going to be like, a, okay, I do this, then I get this, then I do this, then I get this. Can, can you talk to, uh, to us about some of the angst that you went through as you, and that sounds crazy to have angst while you're moving towards joy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I have always been very mission driven. So even being based in Silicon Valley and having like clients like Google and Twilio and Salesforce and all these big tech tech companies, um, I have always been really mission driven and always done lots of volunteer work. And, you know, my my goal hasn't just been make sales. Like when I created this epigenetic software company, it was really to help people find optimal health. And so when I, when that business collapsed and I found myself in a real state of depression and anxiety, I wanted to apply what I'd learned from a scientific perspective and from these doctors and researchers that I'd had the good fortune to work with to kind of test, well, can, can I create the conditions for joy? Can I get myself out of this using the techniques that I learned. And I applied kind of what I knew best, which was like how to make a business plan. So I approached it from that perspective, like, okay, I am going to take 30 days and I am going to take step, you know, A, B, and C, and I am going to create joy. And no, it did not go in a straight line. Um, But I was able to, I think, use science and and kind of hack my body i mean that's when i really feel like i became a biohacker like i was learning how to hack my body hack my hormones hack my thought processes so that i could rewire myself and train my limbic part of my brain to be in a state of joy it did not like evolve in in the way that i thought it would and actually you know, what I found was that 
I had to let go of outcomes and really allow things to unfold because like you say, that's where the magic happens. And, and this is a magical world that we live in. And if we can shift our mindset and have an optimistic outlook and train ourselves to focus on gratitude, it shifts the wiring in our brain, like, you know, we talked about those neural pathways. So it shifts the wiring in our brains. And then when we shift that, things in our life actually start to shift. So I think there's a, there's a few reasons for that. One is your eyes, like they've, tra they've tracked the um, eye movements of optimists and your eyes will actually focus on different things. <laughs> if you have wired your brain to be more focused on optimism, you will actually see different things in your environment that you didn't see before. And you will tune out other things. Um, so it may be that there were certain opportunities or beauties or you know relationships that you could have been having that were there all along, but you didn't see them. So that's one thing that will change is that you'll, you know, you'll experience your world differently. And then the other thing is more on the quantum physics side, which is, you know, we, we are vibrational beings. And um, this is what, you know, the message that I'm bringing forward in, in the movie that I'm making right now called Frequency, the Future of Everything, which you, you spoke about, but it has um, luminaries like Joe Dispenza, Greg Braden, Bruce Lipton. And this is really the message that I'm focusing on with this story and this movie and, and just in my own life is that we are actually made of energy like this physical thing that we think is so real it's 99.9999999999 percent empty space we're actually just frequency and energy and and it vibrates at a certain frequency our own our own being is vibrating at a certain frequency and we will attract just like magnets attract the right type of magnetic energy that is a match for that magnet, we will attract similar frequencies based on our own vibration. And this stuff sounds super woo woo, but this is actually also proven in science. And so, you know, rewiring yourself for say a frequency of joy will attract more joyful experiences into your life because that's just literally how the universe works. Well, what I love about your book and what I love about you too, Kai, is you, you make it simple, right? And, and when I say simple, you don't make it easy, but because you know that yeah, this challenge is easy, easy. <laughs> but, but it, but it's simple because, you know, you talked about it where it wasn't about works. It was about faith. Like, and, and I'm not talking from a, from a religious standpoint, but, but when you went into it with a business plan, that, that doesn't work. And I could tell you this every single time that a person is like, okay, uh, talk to me about the seven steps on how to be happier in my life or how to do it. It's like, God, it doesn't matter what seven steps you ever get. If your heart isn't in the right place, your mindset mm. doesn't even matter. And what I keep yeah. hearing from you over and over again is you got to get your heart set right before you can ever even touch your mindset. And when you, yeah. when your mindset gets in, in line, then your skill set can come. But most people, number one, focus on the skill set. They are like, what should I do? But they haven't focused on their mindset. Those who mm -hmm. are just focused on the mindset haven't gone right. to the heart set. And once you get to the heart set, like you were talking about, then you can really make traction. But here's my question for you. Why is science so damn complicated as far as big ass words that most people don't understand? Why don't, why does, why isn't there the person that when I heard synapse in the first, uh, synapses in the first part, I was like, man, I'm, I didn't know what it was. And then I was like, oh, it's just a connector. It's just a connector. <laughs> so why do you think that we don't speak in terms that, that most people can understand it because most people almost count themselves out when they hear super complicated jargon as opposed to keeping yeah. it simple. And this is the reason why I want to say it is because there's three things that my mom gave me and it's exactly in line with what you're talking about. Number one, 
you're awesome. Number two, you're beautiful. Number three, you could do anything that you put your mind to. Now, what she meant was, number one, you're awesome. Separate yourself from your accomplishments. You are not your grades. You are not your accomplishments. You are not all the things that you do, right? This is what she was telling a four of, since I was, uh, I can remember since I was in third grade scratching my back every night. Just three things. You're awesome. Aww. Separate yourself from your accomplishments. Number two, you're beautiful. Don't compare yourself to anyone because you are unique and the uh, comparison is the killer of all joy. Number three, mm. you can do anything that you put your mind to, but just because you could do it doesn't make it right for you. Uh -huh. And she, she kept it simple for a little kid who barely could read, who still can barely read, who only graduated <laughs> from high school. And I think that that's a lot of our society. And I'm not putting down our society. I'm saying I'm one of them. But a lot of times mm -hmm. we get counted out because we don't understand the words that are being said. Why is yeah. science so damn complicated? Mm. I love that you're asking this question. And oh, I love your mom. <laughs> um, well, that's so sweet. She really, she taught you the most, three most important things. So, you know, um, for five years, I taught mindfulness in an elementary school and I would tell my students, look, don't tell your other teachers this, but this is the most important subject you guys are going to learn here. You might use math, you know, it's important to know how to read, but really you need to understand how your brain works and how to like regulate your emotions and you know understand your nervous system and your amygdala and have some tools to help you navigate life and so this is the stuff i taught them i taught them about synapses i taught them about neural pathways i taught them about their amygdala and then i taught them tools like square breathing and gratitude practices and i think that one of the reasons why science is so complicated and people don't understand this stuff is that it should be taught in school it should be taught from a very young age it should be just like required learning like a user manual for being human that you understand some just basic mechanisms of how we're all wired i think it would really help it would really help us all relate to each other if, you know, we learned these things in school. Well, we need, we need more kayas. You know, it's, not, it's not being taught in school yet. So we just need to be, I think, having these conversations a lot more often. Well, and we need more kayas in the world because when oh. you when you did the neural pathways with the paper, and if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook or on LinkedIn, um, I, I want to thank you, Kaya, because you showed neural pathways in such a simple way where every single person could understand. But I think I, I, I find this in the financial world. Um, I, I find this in the real estate world. I find this in the, uh, in the science, scientific world that a lot of times languages are used to exclude a certain part of the people. Mm -hmm. And I, I was freaked out. My friend named Chris Nagel one time, I met him and he's the number one many, money mentor in the, in, the, in the country. And this guy is amazing. He just created a um, software called, um, uh, what is it? The, the Private Money Club. And mm -hmm. when I met him, dude is super smart, Wall Street guy, but uh, has gone into the infinite banking concepts and things like that. But he was using this word over and over again. He kept saying like, oh, the arbitrage, the arbitrage, the arbitrage. And I was like, damn, this guy is smart and I didn't uh -huh. even be able to relate to him and right. then, then I turned around and I did what every single person should do when they hear big words google them and uh -huh. I googled arbitrage and it was just the difference between two numbers that's all it meant and when I uh -huh. understood the word then I wasn't intimidated anymore and I think there's so yeah. many of us that are intimidated by this science and we need more of the kayas of the world because mm -hmm. you're helping to bring the message through a way of a way that we can understand and that, that most people will be able to understand. So let's go into the 30 day plan that you started off with a business plan and then you yeah. realized that it was going to take you a different way. Yeah. So, um, the concept is that it takes on average 21 days to change a habit. Of course, it could be longer. It depends on the habit. It depends on, you know, how long you've had that habit, how ingrained it is. Uh, but the 30 days should be long enough if you do something every day for 30 days to start your brain heading in the direction of forming a new habit. 
Um, so I started with this theory of creating a habit in my brain of experiencing joy. And it was, you know, like we mentioned, really just motivated by um, wanting to feel better. And I just did, I started by just doing the things that I thought would help me feel good. And it was more like happiness, you know, like I'm going to eat yummy food and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to spend time in nature. And I like, it was kind of robotic. Like I am going to create the conditions for joy. Um, but then, you know, I realized like, Hey, as I start to feel a little better, I'm noticing a few more sparkly, magical things happening. I'm going to just kind of try to like let go and lean into that and, and then find gratitude for what's going on and focus on what I'm, what I'm grateful for and focus on um, things like waking up every morning and having a gratitude practice or looking for scanning my environment every day for things that I can feel grateful for and that I can say yes to. And just like imagining that I'm having a conversation back and forth with the universe, like, thank you for that more, please. Or, Oh no, you know, not, not so much of that one, but how about a little bit more of this? And, I tried to get playful with it and turn it into a game. And I talk about a lot of sort of the specific practices in my book that I did. Um, but really it was, you know, just a lot of trial and error. And um, I believe so much in the power of intention. Uh, like when I'm leading people in a psychedelic experience, I, I say it's really important to set an intention because an intention is like drawing a map. It gives your brain a direction to go in. And so I think a big part of it was just having the intention that I wanted to experience joy. I didn't exactly know how it would happen, but I had the intention and then I, I just worked on it every single day with practices. And then as the joy started to appear and, and actual things started to change in my life, I was able to allow that to unfold in a way that um, allowed me to let go of the control. So, Kaya, how does a person then, when they start to go into, uh, you know, gratitude practices or they go into, um, whether it be writing or, or reading or speaking out loud or looking at the stuff, how do they go? Because most of the time what I find is um, that, that people who extreme, er, experience very extremes in their life, right? So they're like you know, they hit rock bottom or they've had tons of trauma, right? Then they are like, mm -hmm. I need to figure, figure out how to find joy. Yeah. And so let's, let's do it in, um, uh, just because I've had this in my family too. Uh, I don't laugh about it because it's funny. It's just ironic. Um, that I, there's been, um, abuses, whether it be drugs mm -hmm. or alcohol. Right. Mm -hmm. And I find that a lot of times people come out of drugs and alcohol and then they find a routine that's a positive one, but then they become addicted to that and focus too much on the plan and the routine right. and that routine becomes their religion. So how does a person stop mm -hmm. the routine from becoming the religion when we talked about it earlier and you helped us to understand this it wasn't about your mindset or your skill set yet your heart set had to be in the right place and that if yeah. you did these things it didn't mean that you were going to get to joy you had to have yeah. that so how can how does yeah. that because that's a that's a fine line to walk because when you take say an alcoholic or a drug addict out of that and you put them into a routine of if you do this in the morning every single morning well if they don't do that sometimes they feel like that little bee inside their head is saying oh you're awful now you're you're right. awful because of that how how can someone manage that yeah well i mean really this is about a state of being so it's a lot about being and not doing and I think that, you know, that can be challenging. That can be challenging for someone like me who's a real doer. And that can be challenging for someone, say, who's in recovery that, that stays in recovery through active practices that they do. But ultimately, as we spoke about, joy is a state of being. And so it really doesn't matter what you do <laughs> as long as you are being in that state of joy. And so you could find the practices that work for you. And as long as those feel good, then do them. But if doing the practices become a chore, if doing the practices become an obsession, 
if doing the practices become your next addiction, then you're not even really activating your parasympathetic nervous system and creating the state of joy anyway. So it's it, a lot of this is about tuning into yourself. Okay. You know, we need to have self-awareness and be able to tell when am I experiencing joy? I mean, maybe it's not even easy to tell, but I think it's understanding the difference between the parasympathetic nervous system and the, and the uh, sympathetic nervous system could be helpful because you can, you can literally feel, you know, your heartbeat like, okay, how's my breathing? How's my heart? A lot of this is, is biological, you know? So how's my digestion right now? Um, how is my thoughts? Are they racing? What's the content of my thoughts? Do I have sweaty armpits? <laughs> you know, like tune into yourself. And then for some people, it might be, what are those things that consistently work for you? And then for others, it might be like constantly switching it up. And it's all good. Like there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's so individual. What's going to get you into a state of joy? So, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'd say it's a difference between being and doing. I, I think it's, it's genius. And, and again, uh, like it goes right back to it. Every single question that I ask you and you, you're so consistent in in the answers, whether it doesn't matter the subject, it's it's not like it's incredible because a lot of times people are just saying you need to do X and if you do X, then you'll get Y. And I find that that's, I, I found in my life that it's not, that's not always true because mm. if, if you don't have, like a person will be like, oh, so what did you do? You know what I mean? And like, okay, well I did this and that, that worked out. And I remember one time I was in New York and I just happened to be standing by backstage at New York in one of the biggest shows in the professional beauty industry. And I was just hanging out and I had a tray of pins. Well, I had no idea that a person was standing behind me going to grab my shoulder and pull me out on stage in front of almost 2,000 people. And I didn't know that. But everyone in the back room got mad at me. And then one guy who was really mad stood by the stairs the next day with a tray of pins waiting for someone to do it to him. And you know what happened? Huh. And you know what happened? Nothing. Because it wasn't huh. his time. And the thing that I keep hearing from you is that it's got to be a signature and personal experience with you. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the question that I have for you here, uh, Kai, too, is, you know, and I see this a lot with eating plans, eating plans and working out plans. Mm -hmm. And I see them and I'll watch and I'll ha I have friends that get into it and they're just like all about it. And then I'll see them one time and they'll just be acting regular and then they'll come to the dinner and they'll be like, can't eat that. I got my own stuff. I got my own packet. I'm doing it. And they're like, I hate, <laughs> I hate this salad, but you know what? I got to do it. My oh, trainer no. told me this. My da -da -da. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just waiting on them to get fatter. Seriously. No, no. I, and it's not, I, I hope that maybe that's petty in me, but I'm waiting for them to get fatter. Cause it, there's the sign. I know that that's not who they are. Can you talk about like, how do we get into a state of being as opposed to a state of doing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, the eating thing I think is really interesting because, you know, I have heard some scientists say like, actually, we don't absorb enough nutrients from food. Like actually what is sustaining our bodies is, is something else. And then that's where we get into this frequency and energy and vibration. You know, there's people that are breatharians on this planet that like have not had food or water for 25 years. I know you like don't want to believe it, but I've met some of them and it's real. So like there are other things, <laughs> there are other realms and dimensions and energies and ways that we can sustain this biological vessel that go beyond the right eating plan. Mm. And so, you know, I'm all for finding the, the food and exercise plan that works with your biology, but that should make you feel really good. And again, it, to me, it just always comes down to how you feel. Uh, for me, I'm vegan because I feel best when I eat that way. And I've tried eating other ways and I just don't feel as good. So, but I'm not like pushing my agenda on anyone else because I think, 
it's just very individual and it's much more important how you feel when you sit down and eat that food. And I think that the blessing that you put on your food and the gratitude that you have for that food is much more important than the nutrient quality of that food because we are energetic beings. And actually, it's more the energy of the food that is sustaining us than uh, the nutrients at this point. I mean, so much of our food is so depleted of soil and the planet, and I could go on and on about that. So I'd say just like gratitude probably sustains us more than anything. (laughs) I think I think everyone I think you had everyone at breathitarian. I've never heard this in my life. I've heard a oh, lot. Really? I have heard a lot of things, but I have never heard a breathitarian. I want to be an in and outitarian is what I would like to be. Because uh, because I tell you that brings me that brings me so much joy. Bowling brings me joy too. Bowling is the last sport that uh, if you get fatter and uh, and more out of shape, then you're better at it. Uh, it, it is it is one of the greatest uh, and it's not a fashion show no one wants to look good there the grimier you are in the bowling alley the better so Kaya, Kaya, let me ask this like who who as a as a world authority right and you're like no I'm not a world yes you are you're a world authority on joy you're in the public's eye who do you allow to truly see and hear Kaya Well, I'm allowing you today, whoever's listening, I've actually shared uh, some things with you today that I've probably never shared with anyone, Um, but I do my best to be an open book um, because if, if anything that I have to share can even help one person, then it's worth it. Um, I have a really close relationship with my dad, so I'm really grateful for him. My dad is a therapist at a a place called Hippocrates Health Institute in West Palm Beach. He's been there for like 35 years. And actually, my dad and I started teaching workshops together when I was 11. Um, So he's he's a really important person in my life. Um, I think I'm I'm really real with my kids. I have two teenage daughters. Um, I'm, I'm a single mom over here with them. And... I think it's really important to be real with your kids. So, uh, you know, they see me cry. They see me have a hard time. They see me work my ass off to find joy. And, and I talk to them a lot. They were totally part of me writing the joy plan. They're in the joy plan. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not hiding too much. I'm, I'm definitely like an accomplisher. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm running some businesses. I'm doing some projects, but um, I try to be real with everybody. If you got to sit down in the room, like if, if I extracted you, you were talking about the, you know, different dimensions, things like that. So we're going to go to the different dimension. If I got to go to the dimension where I could extract Kaya from Kaya and I could sit Kaya across the room from Kaya. Hmm. Right. And so this, it wouldn't be a, you know, Hey, look back at Kaya. This isn't 12 year old Kaya. Or six, this is Kaya. And I just am able to multiply you. And Mm. you sit down and you see Kaya, you see the things Mm. that she's going through as a single mom, the struggles that she has, you know, as far as like sometimes with the accomplishment part, which I still think is there. Right. And you just said it, you said that it was there. Yeah. As you looked into (gasps) Kaya's eyes and if you could look into the camera, what would you say to Kaya right now? Hmm. I would say, Kaya, you're doing a great job and you are perfect just the way you are and it's okay to have hard days and just like keep feeling what feels good and do that. Keep it simple. You're doing great. Kaya, what do you struggle with? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I told you about my daughter, so I'd say that's like the biggest struggle in my life right now. Um, I probably struggle with asking for help or like bringing in enough help. Um, that's yeah, you know, still part of that part of me that what like thinks I have to do it all on my own. So I can be honest about that. Um, I struggle with like wanting love in my life. <laughs> how, how do you want, how do you want someone to love you? Mm, I 
I want someone to love me in a way that we are on a mission of joy together. I think that the most powerful thing that you can experience in relationship is being on a path of growth together. I mean, we're here having this human experience, like we might as well make the most of it and learn and grow and expand. Um, so I'm not like afraid to have someone call me on how I can improve and like help me see where I could um, just, you know, be even better and, and just like, enjoy <laughs> enjoy things together and laugh and and have fun and create and um make magic together i would i that's the kind of love that i invite into my life someday so, so give me give me three specifics for me i like to bowl i want i want my my wife still doesn't bowl with me she goes and she's like are you happy now but I, I mean, bowling. I remember when before before we were, before I met my wife, me and my buddy. His name is Dave. Shout out to Dave Jansen. And Dave and I were at the bowling alley, and we saw a girl, and she was on the like on the uh, the brink of hitting a two hundred game. And we both looked at her, uh, each other. Now, I'm not saying this was the most attractive woman in the world. Actually, she wasn't attractive at all. But we both looked at each other, and she, we said, if she hits a two hundred, we're asking her out on a date. <laughs> and so. so I mean, but I love me some, uh, I love me some bowling. I love me some old school hip hop and I love to dance. Nice. Those three things. I, I hit the, I, when I, I say my wife uh, tolerates bowling, <laughs> she says that if she has some Tupac, some lipstick and a little bit of hairspray, everything's going to be fine. Nice. <laughs> and she, she, could dance, she, could, she could dance. She got rhythm like nobody's business. Oh, that's awesome. So give us some specifics because you, you gave me the, the large side of like, I want to be happy. I want magic. I want that stuff. But I'm saying like how, like in a relationship, in a loving, mm -hmm. like, like what are some of the silly things that you want to do that maybe don't like bring peace to the world, but will bring <laughs> just joy inside of Kaya? Um... I mean, am I allowed to say great sex? <laughs> <laughs> you better not lead with here? that one. Well, you can lead with that one if you want, but we know where that got us. We know where that got us, Kaya, right? So, so, but okay. So we got the one. I'm not going to repeat it, but <laughs> you go, you go with that one. What what else would be there? What else is there? Um, well, I live in Santa Cruz, so I really love hiking in the redwoods. That's like my happy place. Okay. Um, and, um, enjoying like food and meals and just laughing about the world together <laughs> over a nice vegan meal. Okay. So what do you, what do you do? That I just feel like I'm writing my personal ad. <laughs> well, well, I'm saying like, there's probably someone out there. And if anybody's watching, Kaya's a very beautiful woman. She's a very accomplished woman. I mean, she's got an amazing heart. And if you're a single dude out there and you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe we make a match. And then the Kelly Cardenas <laughs> podcast becomes that place where everyone wants to be on because they know they're going to find their match. So but Kaya, help me with this too, because like, what is it that you do? that doesn't have anything, anything, anything to do with what you call your mission in life. And the reason why I say this is because I find, and when, when, when we created the hideout, we created the hideout because I hang with uh, my buddies. Sorry about that. That dread just popped up. Um, <laughs> I've been hanging with my buddies since fourth grade. And we all get together once a year and we rent That's a house so nice. in Encinitas and we ride bicycles. And we ride regular bicycles, not the e-bikes, not against them, but we ride regular bicycles and we bunny hop and we ride wheelies and we skid and act like we're nine years old. Now, my wife mm. is like, honestly, I, I was like, baby, do you want to stop by and see the guy? She's like, no, not, not at all, um, because you guys go do your thing. But she knows when I yeah. come back, I'm so happy. I'm full of joy. But it has nothing to do with my business. It has nothing to do. We are just complete idiots for two and a half days. 
Right. But of course it fuels your business and all those things because it gets you into such a great state of joy that then you can like manifest everything so much more easily. Of course. We don't talk about manifesting. We never use that term though. We're not, I'm not, I'm not looking at my four year old (laughs) or four year old friends and being like, let's manifest. I'm giving you a hard time, Kaya. But (laughs) what, what do you do? What do you, what does Kaya do that is just like that most people wouldn't understand, but you don't have to have them understand that you just do it because it just fills you and it makes you belly laugh. Yeah. What is that? Um, what makes me belly laugh? Well, um, I feel like I'm always looking for things to laugh about, like even things that maybe other people wouldn't laugh about just how like ridiculous the world can be sometimes. Uh, but like things that I just like really do for pleasure. I, I love to take hot baths. Um, I love to read like good juicy novels and I actually, I have a women's circle, you know, that's maybe similar to your group of guy friends. We've been getting together once a month for the past 23 years. So getting together with them, um, sometimes in person, it's been a lot over zoom the past few years. Um, but, um, just, yeah, being with my girls, laughing about everything um that that's like it's hard to say what's not on my mission because i feel like everything is fueling my mission but um you know anything that that fills your cup anything that fills my cup then helps me fulfill my mission so being with my friends fills my cup taking a bath fills my cup reading a good book Um, I guess my guilty pleasure is watching the Kardashians. (laughs) I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. So help me with this. Help me with this because what I find is that, and, but it makes sense because at the first of the podcast, right? At the first of the podcast, when we were talking about that B inside was developed by these things, these traumas that happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to ask a question, but I'm going to ask a question of you, but like, what takes you back to being a little kid? Like, because yeah. most of us lose it. Oh, now, that's such a good question. And, and when I ask okay, this, I will hold, tell you hold what on, I Kaya. like to do. <laughs> hold on, Kaya, because I want to okay. preface this because I was like, what brings you joy? And you were like taking a bath, reading a juicy novel. When you were five years old or four years old or three years old, you wouldn't have been like, you know what's going to make me the happiest in my life is to read a book that's juicy or take a bath. You would have been like, I don't want to take a bath. Like my son, he's 11. He don't want to take no damn bath. And he doesn't want to read a book. What he wants to do <laughs> is put a cape on and jump off his bed. He wants to build a fort that looks like a shanty in his bedroom. So he puts blankets over it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I just built a homeless shelter in your room and you're happy, right? What is it that takes Kyla back to being a little girl? Like, you know, in that joy. (laughs) Well, actually, I always love taking baths. I have always loved taking baths my whole life. (laughs) And I started writing books when I was four years old before I could even like spell words, I would tell my parents the words to write. And I would be like, okay, I need to write this book, write this down for me. Um, and I would, um, actually draw the pictures to the book. And then my dad started recording me on cassette tapes, reading the book and like making my own audiobook. So I wasn't like a, probably a very typical kid. But one thing I have always enjoyed, now that you mention it, um, is playing dress ups. I had like a great costume collection always growing up Um, in my 20s when I lived in San Francisco and this fabulous house. I had these monthly costume parties that became so famous. They were written about in SF Weekly and there were like lines down the road and we had to eventually move them to a club because my house was full of hundreds of people. Um, And I still love to play dress up. So sometimes I will, and and this is something that I can, you know, enjoy with my teenage kids, uh, just like play dress up. (laughs) Just play dress up, like, buy fun clothes at thrift shops and um, put on some crazy music and dance around and, and play dress ups. What is your daughter? <laughs> what is your daughter's not hear enough from you? Oh, what do they not hear enough? Um, you know, I don't know. I feel like I tell them really often sort of similar things that your mom told you, you are awesome. 
you can do anything. You're beautiful. You're incredible. I'm so inspired by you. You're doing a great job. You are really doing a good job being human. This is not, it's not necessarily easy to be human and you're handling it super well. I'm really proud of you. Those are the kinds of things I try and say to them every day. Um, so I hope they're hearing it enough. What, what does Kaya not hear enough from, uh, from the people who are special in her life? Oh, I'm really lucky to have some very wonderful friends. And like I said, my dad, who's a wonderful, uh, supporter in, in my life. Um, but you know, maybe just like, I think with, when anyone is struggling, the best thing that you can say is what can I do to help? How can I help? Um, so, you know, at the moment, things have been very challenging with my daughter. She was in the hospital three times this week. So, uh, I could probably hear that a little bit more. Not that I, but I wouldn't even know how to answer it. It just feels good to be asked. Well, the reason why I ask is because there's a lot of times where we go through in our life and we're, we're, you know, whether we be accomplishing, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're in our lives. And there's little things that we do that we are, we're like, ta-da, but no one says anything. And mm. what, what I found was, is when you, when you celebrate people and you celebrate them specifically, because what I found is when I celebrate my daughter and I don't do it specifically, she calls me to the table on it. Like the other day mm -hmm. I said, I'm proud of you. And she turned and looked at me and she said, why? And I was like, uh, uh, because, and she's like, see, you didn't mean that. You said it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, that's the reason why I ask it is because what, what I found is when you celebrate people specifically, and we did, we do this with our football team, the Wildcats who won last night and the Wildcats yeah. at the end of the, uh, at the end of the game and before the game, they have to go around the, the circle on the team and they have to look at a person, say their name and say something specific they did and then give them a high five. And what yeah. I found is that the kids play at a different level. What mm -hmm. do you What do you wish in the last week someone would have given you a high five for that you didn't get uh, recognized for? Mm. Ooh, you really ask all the hard questions. I love this. Um, okay, in the last week, um, well, uh, one of the things that was, that was super hard that we had to get through this week was, um, my daughter had to get a blood test and it was like a lot of blood that they needed to take. And she has this massive needle phobia and, um, what we had to go through to get her that blood test was really, really extensive. And we did it and she did it and I'm so proud of her. And um, it, was, it was super intense for me, what, you know, what I needed to go through to, to get her to do that. And I don't think most people in my life really understand like what a big deal that was. So maybe just a high five for her and for me, like you guys did it. You got the blood test. That was a super big deal this week. And so if anyone, well, I know the people are out there that are listening that are huge Kaya fans because everyone in the world that's come in contact with her is a huge fan. Make sure that, that, you recognize, that you recognize things like this. The reason why I say it is because it really gives us wings. And, and when I say that, it's not just with Kaya, but if you have a friend who's going through something, acknowledge it. Tell them that they were doing something and celebrate it at a high level. Um, and I tell you, it can, it can impact every, it changes everything. I was just talking about it this morning on a video, uh, where I was, I was talking to entrepreneurs and I said, guys, to be able to change your company culture is as simple as this, write a synopsis every single week from your leaders and post it on an email or, a uh, uh, an email, a public Facebook and recognize the little tiny specific things, use the person's name mm -hmm. and this will change your company. This will change your environment and it will change your culture. And then what will start to happen is it won't be just the leaders that do it. It'll be everyone in the organization that will do it. Yeah. So I love that. You know, there's this, there was a study out of Japan that studied the effect of giving someone a compliment. Uh, it's not exactly, you know, compliments that you're talking about, but it's the same kind of thing. Recognition, sp specific recognition. And they found that when you give someone a compliment, it activates the striatum, which is a particular area of the brain. Where's it at? Is Where's it at? Is it back here? Where's it at, Kaya? <laughs> it's, it's somewhere in there. I don't actually know where that one's located. What, what is it called? Say the name again. 
striatum. Striatum. I like striatum. Yeah, the striatum. striatum. And it is the same part of the brain that is activated when you give someone cash. So you know how good it feels when somebody gives you money. <laughs> and I think it just like gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, pay someone a compliment. Like it literally activates this part of the brain that makes you feel like somebody just like gave you a gift. So I, I do try and do that. Um, I mean, I'm actually an introvert, so it's, it's not that easy for me to like, I'm calling shenanigans. I'm calling shenanigans. I'm calling (laughs) shenanigans. I have never (laughs) called shenanigans on the podcast ever in 225 episodes. I have never called shenanigans. I believe oh, really? I believe that what you call an introvert, if you go back to the first of this podcast, you'll reason you'll understand the reason why an introvert was constructed. And that yeah. is protection. And I can tell yeah. you this, on this podcast you haven't been an introvert with me. That's true. Meeting you was an introvert, but you know what it was? There was two things. Two. You want to know what they are? Through this whole podcast, and I want every single one of you, and I I say rewind, but we're not in 1985, and this is not a tape. But I want you to go back in this podcast. I want you to listen. There was two common themes that you've said the whole entire time, and you've stayed consistent with it. You know what it was? You want to call them before I call them? You tell me. (laughs) Number one, you said that you wanted to feel safe, and number two, you said you wanted to feel loved. Yes. And when those two things happen, you're not an introvert anymore. Mm. You are so perceptive. And I think I feel really safe with you. And that's why probably I haven't been an introvert with you. <laughs> you just, you, you make people feel really safe and really seen and really celebrated. And you're just so beautiful. Your mom was right. So I appreciate that about you. I don't, I don't feel that way with a lot of people. But what I was going to say is a lot of times I like see things that I want to say. I want to like give someone a compliment and then I feel shy to do it. So I, I do try and challenge myself to do that because I know it makes people feel so good. Well, I want to challenge you because you you have a joy about you, but also too, like, you know, when we met and, and it, that, that joy came to the surface, I, I could feel a reality in it and that's not very common. And that gift, Mm -hmm. that gift that you have to give to the world is so very, very, very important. And that's the reason why I wanted to take you to the places where we went today on the podcast, because, you know, I like, and it's not out of disrespect, because I, I mean, I respect you at the highest level. Um, We're going to go, we're going to go through some rapid fire. Okay. You're going to have 30 seconds. You're going to have 30 seconds on these answers. Now I asked a guy, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what was it on Wednesday? I think it was Wednesday. Maybe it's Thursday. It's Thursday. Chianti. And I said 15 second uh, answers and he, he went for like a minute now. Okay. I'm going to do my now, best. So we're going to do 30 seconds. And if we can communicate that beforehand, then it's not emotional when I say the time's up. Right. <laughs> okay. Because that would be really insensitive if I was like, if I just asked you a question and in my head, I thought 30 seconds and then you got to the 30 seconds and I was like, stop, that would be unemotional unemotional is being able to communicate beforehand what it is that I want. And that's what Kaya is going to do in her relationships from this point forward. That way she's not going to date any more knuckleheads. <laughs> so here we go. Here we go. You're going to, I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions. You got 30 seconds to answer these, right? Okay. Nicole, let's do you it. Ready? Are you ready? Right, yes. Okay. Yes. Nothing, nothing's off limits either. I get, I get it. I got, I got, okay. <laughs> all right. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll start off with a, um, we'll start off with an easy one. Okay. What can a person do right now today to start their joy journey? Oh, um, start with noticing all the things that you're grateful for and write them down, get a notebook and carry it around with you and write things down throughout the day that you notice that you're grateful for. Gratitude is actually the fastest way to switch your brain into a state of joy. What is Kaya an absolute superhero at that no one can compete with her on this earth? Um, I think I'm just able to like really do a lot of things. I don't know why, but I seem to be able to 
do a lot of things at once and do them pretty well. Not to toot my own horn, but I don't know. I, I asked the question, so you're allowed to toot your own horn in this. But I knew <laughs> that you were going to be very humble. That's a humble person, and, you know. But I'm not humble about you, so I want you to know that you're amazing, and you know it's incredible to see be able to see what you do. Okay, here we go. Thirty seconds. The dude who molested you at four years old sitting across the table from you. What do you say to him? Um, well, I'm sure that you had some pain in your life too. And I, man, I want to say I forgive you. I mean, you know, he was a kid too, an older kid, but a kid. So like, yeah, I forgive you. I'd like to say that. You, you got your mama in the room, 30 seconds to tell her something that maybe you haven't ever told her or expressed to her. What is it? Mm. Oh, mom, you have had a super hard life and I know that you have always done your best. And I am really grateful that you were my mom because I learned how to be strong from you. We're going to switch gears here. There's two women in every woman. There's one that is doing exactly what they think they ought to do, ought to say, and ought to be. Then mm-hmm. there's the, what my re- what wife refers to as the catch me outside. And I'm going to explain this because my wife, we were having the conversation the other day. She's going to kill me for saying this. Okay. Her name is Brooklyn. I love Brooklyn and I'm a very in love with Brooklyn and I'll always be in love with Brooklyn and you get more beautiful every day. Oh, I can't Although wait I'm gonna, to meet her. Uh, she's amazing. You're going to love her. And I'm going to get in trouble on this one because we had a conversation. She said, she said, I struggle. I said, what do you struggle with? She said, I struggle because there's two parts of me. I said, what is the two parts? She said, all the things I should do, should be, should mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there's the catch me outside. And I was like, what's the catch me outside? She said, that's the gangster inside me. Then when a person does me wrong, I want to punch them in their face. But I should mm-hmm. do this. So this is what I say. So I'm going to ask you to go to the catch me outside part of Kaya. Okay. Because there's the joy side of Kaya that has become this manifested, amazing person. But there's also a woman who, I don't know if you're petty like me, but sometimes I just want to, I mean, honestly, I just want to show them. Like in in my life, or my wife says that same thing. She's like, catch me outside. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) Um, Do you have those two? Do you have the two? I, I do. I think there's a, there's a couple scenarios where it gets trigger, triggered. Um, one is my frustration with doctors. Uh, I mean, I, I have to take my daughter to so many freaking doctor's appointments. And over the years, it's just so frustrating that these doctors like can't figure stuff out that I end up figuring out and just putting my daughter through hell with endless wrong diagnoses and taking us down the wrong path. So catch me outside. I might be like screaming or crying in my car about the frustration over certain things about our medical system. Um, and yeah, just, you know, I've had a few narcissists in my life and don't always have the nice things to say about them in my (laughs) private moments. The the reason why I say it is because I believe that we all have it, but we don't, we don't talk about it, and it's not something that's hugely celebrated. I want to celebrate it because there's times where I'm really petty. Like I, I just got to speak at an event, and this woman went before me, and she had the craziest like uh, you know story of she had a seat, uh, she had a, a a stroke, and she's like super young. She has this little daughter, and she went on before me, and. Like, how do you follow that? You can't. So I just walked, I seriously, I walked out on stage, Kaya, and I looked at her and I'll, you look on my social media, there's, there's one, there's a video of it and I walk out and I'm like, I don't like you at all. Like, I don't like that woman. Um, I don't, I, I think you, you're, everyone thinks that you're an awesome person and I don't think you're an awesome person because you went on before me. And now <laughs> I, I was joking, but I was serious. You know what I'm saying? Because right. how are you going to follow something like that? When's the last time that something like that has happened? in your life where your platform told you that you need to say a certain thing, but, but your mind that catch me outside was like, I don't want to do that right now. Um, I'm not 
wish I don't I'm not thinking of a time like that that has happened actually I wish I had a good answer for this one you've conditioned <laughs> yourself very well for joy and then I'm saying like I I I have I have joy I have joy in my life but I tell you and I'll tell you, you, you I'm, joy. I'm gonna give you another one okay and this is okay. petty this is super petty I pick my daughter up from school, Aviara Oaks Middle School in Carlsbad. So I'm going to call myself out. If you go there, you know who you are that I'm about to talk about. You pick, I pick my daughter up in the, um, in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood, there's places to park. And there's curbs, right, that are a certain size that certain cars won't fit in that curb and you'll be off into the person's driveway, right? And so a normal person would say that you will park where your car will fit as mm -hmm. opposed to where you want to park. And I tell you almost every single day, grown people with parents, maybe, maybe their parents didn't hug them enough, but they will pull into the space in front of me and block somebody's driveway. And I'm like, it just, I just want to get out and I want to shake them. I want to shake them. You know what I mean? And then I think, if I did that and somebody videoed me and then they heard me talk about joy, they'd be like, ah, that's not you. <laughs> so I'm calling myself out. So nobody calls me out on it. Is there anything okay. petty? Is there anything petty that you've done in the last week or month that we can know about Kaya? Um, well, I can tell you a confession is that I am very directionally challenged. I just like don't seem to have any kind of inner GPS and I get lost really easily. Um, I don't know if this exactly falls into the same category as you, but parking garages are like my kryptonite. And even though like I really try and pay attention to where I parked and I'll like take a picture of it. Um, I can often come back to try to find my car and be searching for my car for a really long time and get really frustrated and even scared, like, oh, my God, I'm going to, like, spend the night in this parking garage because I'm never going to find my car. Um, so that happened um, at the L.A. airport. I was, I was parked in this parking garage. Thankfully, I ended up finding a person that worked at the parking garage and showing him the picture that I took. And he like walked all around the thing and helped me find my car. But it's that bad. It's really bad. Kaya, what do you what do you wish people would ask you more? I wish people would ask me more. Um, well, I mean, we haven't talked about it much, but I I am working in the psychedelic medicine industry. I started a at-home ketamine treatment company called KetaMD, and I'm the vice president at a R&D company for psychedelics for the pharmaceutical industry called Psychoceutical. It's a topic I'm really passionate about because psychedelics can change the neuroplasticity in your brain. So I wish people would ask me about that. I think it's a subject matter that's becoming less and less taboo and, and people are curious about it. And it's a subject I, I love to talk about my own personal experiences and what's available and how to help people or who are suffering. What do you say to the person who says psychedelics, like my, my parents did that back in the sixties or a lot of people on the street tried psychedelics and then they went on a trip and then they never came back. This is, this yeah. is the side that a lot of people will argue. So sure. what do you say to a person like that when you're talking, cause you're talking about microdosing, am I correct? I, ayahuasca, sure. yeah. things like that. Like you're, yeah. you're hearing it become more prevalent and it's mm -hmm. amazing for me because it's becoming more prevalent with people who you wouldn't think would be doing microdosing and, and things like that. And mm -hmm. so what do you have to say to maybe a parent that is like, are you kidding me? Ketamine, like ketamine, because ketamine, yeah. like, wait, isn't that bad? Isn't special, that a party drug? Special, special K, K as they call it, mm -hmm. special K mm -hmm. as they call it, like those kind of things. Can you, can you explain that to us? What, I mean, like if you had a person say that, yeah. what would be your response? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, a lot of new research and science is coming out. So we're having new understanding about these compounds that we didn't have before. And second of all, the set and setting is so crucially important. These are medicines. And when you use these medicines, just like any other medicine in the wrong setting, you don't know the quality, you're not with the right people, you don't have the right mindset, you can definitely have a bad experience. So it's not just like take any psychedelic anytime, anywhere. That's not what I'm advocating at all. But under the right circumstances, with the right medicine, with the right intention, with the right support, 
support with the right integration. These are very powerful tools for accomplishing what I wrote about in the joy plan, which is get your brain into a state of extra neuroplasticity and then rewire those neural pathways for joy. Psychedelics can actually be a very powerful reset that you could do first and then follow the steps in the joy plan. But it you know, has to be done right. It has to be done safe. Absolutely. So you're saying that the club is not the place to to start <laughs> to start not. to start on your joy journey. Yeah, yeah. No, are we hearing sure. this correct? Are we hearing this yes. correct? Yes. Like for example, with ketamine, you know, special K is like a powder that you sniff up your nose in a club party scene and hits opiate receptors. It's a totally different thing. I mean, the same compound, but administered in a totally different way and has a different biological effect than the kind of ketamine that we use with Keta MD, which is a lozenge that you take sublingually while you're being watched over by a nurse on telemedicine, your blood pressure is taken, you've had an intake with a doctor, and then you're doing integration coaching to actively rewire those neural pathways during this time of extra neuroplasticity. They're just very, very different. The, the, the chemical compound might be the same, but it's being used in a different way. So all of you who just thought that that was an invitation to continue to do what you're doing, it's not. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing, though, too, because there's so many things that are meant for good that are not used for the right situation. Am I correct on this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think there's just a lot of people who are suffering in the world and, you know, looking for some relief and that's like kind of the difference I talk about, like the difference between hedonism and joy. Um, because like one of the things my ex-husband said to me when I was doing the joy plan was like, oh, the joy plan, like I'm just going to sit around and watch sports and eat junk food and watch porn all day. Like that's my joy plan. And I was like, no, that's not what it's about. Like it's not just about numbing out and, um, you know, finding ways to get hits of dopamine all the time. It's about actually like rewiring your whole body so that your parasympathetic nervous system is activated and you and you're vibrating at a certain frequency that's changing the like quantum field around you. It's, it's a higher level thing. So like I get it, there are people that are using substances in a way to kind of numb pain. And that is not what like an ideal psychedelic experience isn't about numbing pain, it's about healing pain. So on this joy journey that you're on, I mean, and, and when I say a joy journey is because you're continuing, mm -hmm. you're continuing this. It's not just, uh, you know, because I think a lot of times people will think that, again, I do these seven steps, then everything's going to work out and then it's just I'm going to be good. What do you yeah. say to the person who looks at the joy plan is like, you know, they read the first chapter and they're like, okay, she said 30 days, seek joy. Okay, everything's going to be cool. I'm stopping the book at that and I'm just right. going to focus on these joy things. What do you say to that person? Well, um, skip ahead a little bit into the book and then you'll see that I say, um, you know, after 30 days, I realize this is not a 30 day plan. This is a lifestyle. And especially if you're someone like me who struggles with a very active default mode network, that's the part of your brain that will have these repetitive thoughts. It defaults to usually uh, in many people's cases, like ruminating and worrying um, if you have that, then being on the joy plan is something that you have to practice pretty much all the time. So like brace yourself. This is not a temporary 30 day thing. It takes 30 days to shift your mindset and to start forming these new habits and start forming these new neural pathways, but it is a lifestyle. You got, you got to be in it for the long game. How can a person, you know, have more of an experience? Because, I mean, everyone who's on the uh, listening to the podcast right now wants more of Kaya, wants to be able Aww. to spend time, wants to be able to spend time with you, wants to be able to, you know, have a little bit more of a, if, if someone wanted to have more of an up close situation, I'm not just talking about the dating side. There's going to be those dudes too. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, I, so we'll, we'll give it, well, I'm going to get, I ever expected to get into it. I know, podcast. I know. I'm going I'm to give her, I, I'm actually going to sell your information after this. This is the, uh, they talk about monetization and uh, that's what I'm going to do. But I'm just, I'm talking from, I'm talking from a joy standpoint and, and, uh, also the trainings and the, the, the experiences that, that you do. Is there any that are coming up or any that people can be a part of? 
Oh, well, thank you for asking. Um, I am on social media. So if people want to follow me on Instagram, I'm Kaya Roman author, uh, also Kaya Roman author on Facebook. You can find me Kaya Roman on LinkedIn, at Kaya Roman on Twitter. Um, so it's like probably that's a good place if you're on social media to, to follow what I'm up to. I speak at certain conferences. Um, I'm going to be at uh, a conference called Wonderland in Miami coming up in early November. Um, I, I do sometimes lead retreats. So if, if any, I don't have any planned at the moment, so if any are coming up, I'll put those on my social media. And if you are interested or curious about, you know, having a psychedelic experience, especially well, ketamine is the psychedelic that's legal in this country and all this incredible research shows it can have a really profound effect if you're struggling from depression anxiety or ptsd it has been very profound in my joy journey and i I'm, you know very proudly uh, the co-founder of keta md so i do encourage you to go to ketamd.com or you can download the keta md app in the app store or google play check that out do some research learn about how that might help rewire neural pathways. Uh, read my book. <laughs> it's available on Amazon. It's available on Audible as an um, audiobook if you'd like to listen to books. Uh, it's available in like Barnes & Noble, Walmart, Target, those kind of places as well. Um, what else? If you are interested in Psychoceutical, which is the other company that I'm involved in, which is more like for the future, sort of when, you know, psychedelics become legal or in countries where they are legal. These are uh, delivery methods for the pharmaceutical industry to help these psychedelic medicines really target certain receptors in the brain and bring these medicines to people who they can help. I'm, I'm really excited about the work that that company is doing. Um, and also, you know, it's publicly traded. You can buy the stock and I think it's a good investment. So, uh, so that's, that's one, you know, that I encourage people to check out as well. So those are a few of my projects follow, follow along for the documentary that's coming up as well. Um, I'll be posting about that on social media. Well, I encourage everyone to consume because, again, like when you get a chance to hear you talk, uh, but also, I mean, when you get a chance to to read your book, um, which is phenomenal. I mean, so gripping. Oh, and, thank you. And I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. It comes from a standpoint that's not preaching at you and telling you all the things you have to do. It's just taking you on a journey through someone who is saying, like, look, I'm not perfect. I'm on this journey. And you know what? These things have been working. And, and I've been able to see, you know, I'm you're, you're such an example of joy because not all the circumstances in your life would point to you have a smile on your face. And yeah. that, that is such a, a huge thing. So the reason why I started the podcast is because of my kids. Mm. And I wanted to take iconic people like yourself. Number one, I wanted to make them laugh. I wanted to make them cry. I wanted to make them think. But I also wanted to show my kids that there's no idols in life, that there are just people like yourself who mm. is an icon, the uh, joy authority in this country, and <laughs> or if not all over the world. And But Kaya Roman is a human being that has blood running through her veins that is simply in line with her purpose. And she has a phenomenal attitude and crazy work ethic. <laughs> so what advice would you have for Maddox, who's 11 years old, little superhero, 13 year old McKenna, what advice would you have for the two of them? And if you could use their names, Maddox and McKenna, it would be awesome. Okay. Hey, Maddox and McKenna. Ooh, you guys are at a pretty interesting age. Things are going to get a little rocky for you in the coming next few years. So I would encourage you to learn a couple of techniques that might help you when you start to have some big feelings. Um, one of them is called square breathing. And I'd love to just teach this to you real quick. Um, because I find it to be very, very helpful in moments when I just need to like calm my body down and get myself back into a place of like, okay, now I can take the next step. Um, it's a big, big thing to go through being your age. It's not always easy. You're lucky you've got really awesome parents. Um, but you might even go through a time when you don't think they're so awesome. So let me teach you uh, really quick how to do square breathing. And you might want to even draw a square in front of you. So what you do 
is you breathe in to a count of four, breathe in one, two, three, four, then hold your breath for one, two, three, four, like draw the square at the top, then exhale one, two, three, four, and then hold your breath one, two, three, four. And if you do that just for one minute, in one, two, three, four, hold one, two, three, four, exhale one, two, three, four, hold one, two, three, four, and do that breath, what that's going to do is it's going to calm down this part of your brain called the amygdala that's going to tell you everything's going wrong. And when you go through being a teenager, your amygdala can get super active and you can think that things are wrong even when they're maybe not. So remember, you've got that tool in your toolbox and you're really awesome. I can't wait to see what you're like when you're older. Kaya, I just did the, the 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 square breathing while you were doing it, and I tell you, I, and everyone out there listening, you need to do that. Go, go rewind it a little bit if you didn't if you didn't do it, but do it. And I, it's it's crazy. Like I mean, it was crazy to feel that. And I you were like one, two, three, four, and I was like, whatever, square breathing. She's gonna tell me some technique, and but. I did it, it reluctantly. Really works, though. Okay. And I was being petty. I was being petty. I just want to let you know that I was. Okay. And I was like, this, thing, this, ain't gonna, this is not going to bring my joy into my life. And then I did it. And I was like, damn, Kaya is right. She's always Aww. right. So I want, I want to thank you. <laughs> this you know? is girl telling my daughter. Is this so <laughs> random? But, oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you find it useful. You know, I just, I like having tools in my toolbox. And that one is an easy one. And the thing about the amygdala, this is, you know, that danger center in, uh, sensor in the brain, the cue to, exactly, the cue to the amygdala that it's safe to stop sounding the alarm is oxygen. So that's why it was always so annoying to me when I was a kid and people, would, I would freak out and people would just be like, just breathe. But that's why, like, if you can actually get oxygen into your brain, your amygdala will calm down. And this is physiological. And I just feel like all kids should understand this. So Kaya, we got to, we got to have you on the podcast again. Uh, oh, I, 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 I want to have you on, a, I mean, over and over again. I think it would be cool oh, if we no. did, if we just went and we did a check-in and we, every month we created a time where we were able to have the joy episode and that you were talking about different things. I mean, I'm, I'm already scheduling you for this, but I, I think it would be really cool. I mean, I, obviously I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. And you won't have to force me, <laughs> but, uh, but I think I think it would, I just think it would be awesome to be able to do. And so, um, and what I'm, what I'm hoping, uh, Sarah is on the, uh, on the line too. She's been watching and she's been commenting. I want to read off a couple of comments that she's, oh. Uh, that she's talked about. So she was commenting all the way down. She was uh, laughing and wow, wow, wow. Uh, she was talking Aww. about how powerful it was. And then uh, she went into um, one that w that she said, uh, she's excited to buy your book, but then she said, fight, flight, and freeze. Oh, and, yes. Right? And I'm so, so glad she brought that up. And so, you know, I just want you to know that, that, that you're making such an impact in people's lives. Aww. And it, it's just, it's phenomenal. Uh, Sarah, you are going to make me cry. <laughs> you should, you should cry every single day. If it, if it only takes, this is, this is what happened. One time I had a guy come in quick story, had a guy come in. Uh, I complimented him on his watch. He came back like three, uh, like maybe two hours later and he gave me this watch. <laughs> And, and I was like, man, thank you so much. At the time, I mean, I was a young kid. It was like an $1,800 watch. I had never, I had a swatch on. Whoa. And he gives me this $1,800 watch. And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. My life has changed. And he grabbed me and pulled me close. And he looked me in my eyes like he was going to fight me. And I was like, wow, I was kind of scared. And he said, if all it took for you to be that happy in your life was to have a watch on your wrist, someone should have given you a watch a long time ago and let it go. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and so what I, want to, what I want to tell you, if all it takes to be able to make you cry is a simple compliment, then every one of your friends that's listening to this needs to compliment you more on specific things that you think that you should be complimented on. Yeah. I think we should all be doing that for each other a yes. lot more. I'm really glad that you brought that up. I mean, it's, it's so easy, right? It's so easy to give in that way. And it does so much to fill us up. Well, you're, you're we need incredible. to be lifting each other up as much as we can. You're incredible, Kelly. Seriously. <laughs> like, 
I was watching some of your videos and some of your interviews and I was just feeling so good, just like absorbing your energy. Um, and like I said about the mirror neurons, like I love downloading your mirror, mirror neurons because I feel like you are a person who really truly embodies joy. Um, obviously, you got some great lessons early on and you really walk the talk. So anything you ever want to do, any collaboration, anytime you ever want me back on the podcast, count me in. Um, I am your joy friend for life for sure. This has been uh, an unexpected <laughs> conversation <laughs> in some ways, but um, very profound. And I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you and your beautiful heart. Thank you. And uh, the, the thing that I want to say to all the listeners, number one is thank you. Um, every single one of you out there, we have done, when I say no promotion, we have sponsors on the podcast, but we have done no promotion, no paid promotion ever. I have never, uh, you know, paid for an ad in another magazine or digitally to promote the podcast. It's all been through organic. It's been through all, every one of you listening. That got us into the top 1% globally of all podcasts. And so I want to thank every, every, and I want to thank every single one of you. The other thing that I want to tell you is don't let the smooth taste fool you. When you see me smiling on social media, laughing on social media, you see a video. I had one guy tell me I had turned your social media off because I've got bad things in my life and mm -hmm. you, you were always happy and that's not my life. And so yeah. what I want to tell you is don't let the smooth taste fool you, meaning that it's not about the things that have happened in my life. Losing my mom four years ago, losing my dad last December, who was my best friend. My dad was only 68. My mom was only 62. This is not a sob story. But all yeah. the things that we went through in our life, my parents were always, 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 and I understand why they were doing it. They were always letting me know and giving me the keys to help me to understand that it had nothing to do with my circumstances, but everything to do with me choosing joy in my life. Yeah. And, and I want to, I, I, I just want to make sure that people understand when you see me laughing or you see me joyous or you see me with a smile on my face, it's not because my business wasn't broken into uh, every, once a year for the first five years. It wasn't because every single uh, uh, stream of income when the, um, when the pandemic hit, that every single stream of income that I was diversified in got taken away. It's not because none of that stuff happened. It's not because I don't get kicked in the head and punched in the mouth. It's because I have learned to choose joy. And I love the fact that we have the authority on joy here with us, Kaya Roman. And I want to thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to thank every single person out there, again, mm -hmm. listening and, and helping us uh, through this, this journey and to be able to have conversations like what we're having now, which is real ones. And um, mm -hmm. Kaya, you have been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I really, really appreciate you. And uh, I know every single listener out there, share this, guys. Share it with your friends. Share it with every single person that you possibly can, because I think there needs to be more Kaya in the world. Well, there needs to be more joy in the world, that's for sure. So I hope that uh, we we shared some information that people can benefit from. And thank you so much, Kelly. This has been really, really fun. You are officially off the hot seat. <laughs>